All right, um, so we'll get started now. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for joining the Agora Student Forum on Closing the Civilian Military Divide. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, the Institute, SNF Agora is an academic center and public forum at Johns Hopkins University that's dedicated to improving and expanding uh, civic engagement and informed inclusive dialogue as the cornerstone of our global democracy. Um, so a few housekeeping notes for everyone. Um, the panel discussion between me and Colonel Pfeiffer will last about 30 minutes and then we'll take questions from the audience. Uh, so submit your questions at any time uh, during the program uh, using the Zoom chat box function and the moderator will choose questions uh, to pose to us. Um, and during the Q&A part of the forum, uh, the audience members are welcome to unmute and uh, ask their questions once prompted. Uh, we'll also be recording the first half of the conversation. Um, so you know, per university guidelines, please uh, keep your uh, camera and mic muted during the first portion. And then during uh, the, the second, second half when we're not uh, recording, then you can turn it back on. Um, and then the uh, recording will be available on the SNF Agora website and the YouTube channel. Uh, the, the question, uh, the audience Q&A, uh, again, will not be recorded. Um, so with that, um, my name is Grace Park. I'm a former US Army officer and a current fellow at the SNF Agora Institute here at Johns Hopkins. Um, after the Black Lives Matter movement pro protests of the summer of 2020 and the still recent siege at the Capitol, um, discussions about activating the National Guard and even federal troops um, have really come to the forefront of our discussions. Um, as a veteran, I, I really believe in the efficacy of debating the role of the US military in our democracy. Um, but I've also been a little bit frustrated at times um, by these conversations and some of the misconceptions that we may have um, concerning the military. Um, I think that sort of divide that we talk about has uh, come about for numerous reasons, uh, you know, after the Vietnam War or the smaller scale conflicts that we have now. Um, uh, I, so I, I hope uh, that Colonel Pfeiffer and I can sort of answer some questions um, so we can have uh, really informed discussions. Um, so without further ado, I'm really excited to introduce Colonel Pfeiffer. She is the professor of military science here at Johns Hopkins, uh, the Blue Jay ROTC battalion, a really historic battalion in ROTC. Uh, Colonel Pfeiffer is a strategic intelligence, of, uh, intelligence officer with a wealth of knowledge and a very unique and dynamic career. So I'm really excited to learn from her today. Um, and I hope you are all too. So ma'am, thank you for joining us um, and please take it away. Yeah, so um, thank you for, thanks to all of you for taking your time to, to listen to this. Um, and I'd also like to thank the SNF Agora Institute for, for hosting this and especially to you, uh, Grace, for, for actively inviting me to, to come and participate in this forum. Uh, so as Grace mentioned, I'm the director of the military science department at Johns Hopkins, and my program actually consists of students from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, University of Baltimore, Stevenson University, and MICA, and Johns Hopkins, of course. Uh, so combined, we're about 65 to 70 cadets each year. So most of you don't know, uh, but of the 268 ROTC battalions across the, the United States, Johns Hopkins is actually the oldest program in the United States, and we continue to be revered as one of the most preeminent commissioning programs for second lieutenants in the United States Army. So while I initially enlisted in the Army Reserves when I was 20 years old, my dad, who was a retired first sergeant, and we'll talk a little bit about rank structure in a bit, um, he, he convinced me that I had a little bit more to offer and that I should go and look at ROTC, which is the Reserve Officer Training Program. So I eventually earned my commission through the University of California, Davis, upon graduating with my undergraduate degree. So all officers do have to have a minimum of an undergraduate degree. I commissioned into the Air Defense Artillery uh, branch as an officer, and at that time I was trained on the only weapon system that was available to females, and that was the Patriot weapon system. So my first tour was in Hanau, Germany, uh, where I worked to perfect my trade, uh, in addition to working with our foreign partners. So I worked with uh, partners from Greece, Holland, Germany, and Israel. And from there, I transitioned to military and strategic intelligence, and that a career allowed me to serve across um, all echelons spanning from company command uh, to working in the Pentagon directly with senior army leaders on the, ar on the army and joint staffs. So overall, I have moved eight times in 20 years with two tours in Germany. Those are three year tours each uh, and, and three deployments. And believe it or not, some would probably say that I've had the more, one of the more stable careers in the army. 
So uh, I'm eager to share my perspectives and my experiences in the Army and hearing from you and, and answering any of your questions. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Grace. Thank you, Colonel Pfeiffer. Um, like I said, I mean, a very interesting career, uh, certainly. So um, first, we're going to start with some macro questions. I think these are some of the bigger questions that a lot of people have uh, been wondering. Uh, so the first one is, um, what is the difference between the National Guard, the Army Reserve, and the Active Army, also known as the Regular Army? Sure. So uh, the Army is comprised of three components, which, as Grace mentioned, is the Army Reserve, the Army National Guard, and the Active Duty. Force. So I'll start with the National Guard. So the National, uh, the National Guard is actually mandated by the Constitution, and that allows for each state to maintain what we consider a militia. And while that term is no longer used, each state can maintain its own part-time military capability to serve as the governor sees necessary and within the scope of the law. So the National Guard soldiers tend to be part-time soldiers, and we say one week in a month, two weeks a year. Um, and are generally residents of the state uh, where they serve. So the National Guard has almost all job branches, including operational branches, such as the infantry and field artillery. And since the National Guard works for the governor, they're typically activated when there's some sort of natural disaster. Uh, and more recently, they've been called upon to assist in COVID relief efforts. And yes, they can be called upon to assist in civil, civil unrest. So Title 32 of the US Code outlines the training roles and authorities for the National Guard, and the National Guard can be mobilized by the president to serve uh, for national defense. So for example, National Guard units have deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. So after that, we would say, I would look at the Army Reserves, the US Army Reserves, which is very similar to the National Guard in that they are also a part-time soldier or part-time capability, meaning one weekend a month, two weeks a year. Uh, however, unlike the National Guard, the Army Reserve is a federal force, and they operate under Title 10 of the U.S. Code. Further, the Army Reserve units generally consist of support and service support capabilities, with some units aligning to Special Operations Command. The Army Reserve uh, can support state operations, for example, Hurricane Katrina relief operations had National Guard, Army Reserve, and active duty soldiers all working together to support that relief effort. Um, and Army Reserve, to, Army Reserve officers, just like National Guard, typically have a day job. So uh, they can be anywhere from congressmen, they can be sold, uh, police officers, they can be teachers, they, whatever their job may be. Um, but because the Army, Regar, uh, the Army National Guard and the Army Reserve have na uh, normal jobs, uh, they tend to actually be a really good force multiplier because when they are activated, they bring a host of experiences and skills that are well beyond their military specialty. And then the last one is the active duty force. So we're the full-time soldiers. So we typically work Monday through Friday, six to you know six p.m. Um, and we work until, or we can work until the mission com uh, is complete. So clearly, my duty day is still at seven o'clock at night uh, until the mission is done. And so soldiers, active duty soldiers, get paid to be available twenty-four hours a day, three hundred and sixty-five days a year. That's why we don't actually get overtime when we deploy. So we are federal soldiers operating also under Title 10 of the U.S. Code, which makes our commander in chief, the president of the United States, same as with the Army Reserve Service members. Great, thank you. Um, so, I mean, I think the next question that we wanted to talk about was, um, can the active duty military be called upon to serve on American soil? Um, and I, I think, you know, we covered this a little bit with the National Guard um, topic, but um, yeah, this was another question that we want to ask. So, uh, so yes, the active duty military can be called upon to conduct operations on American soil, but those are typically limited in scope. Um, so like the National Guard and the Army Reserve, they tend to be activated to help if there's a natural disaster or to defend American soil against foreign or domestic enemies, or to assist um, if a state should, uh, if a state should, um, should claim a state of emergency and they request for federal assistance, whatever that may look like. So in the past, the US military has scrambled jets to intercept aircraft who may have traveled into restricted airspace. They were mobilized during hurricanes, wildfires, and other natural disasters. The military works with other federal agencies on counter drug and counter terrorism missions. Uh, Army Reserve troops were mobilized during the 1992 LA riots, 
And more recently, they've mobilized to assist in COVID relief efforts and to protect federal buildings in Washington, DC. So the scope of the situation will drive what army component or military branch uh, will mobilize to operate on American soil. However, when it does occur, it is with the full knowledge of the highest levels of state and federal government. Yeah, I would say that um, to call upon active duty military is often very controversial. Um, I think even, and probably especially the 1992 riots uh, or the Watts riots in both in LA. Um, so yeah, agreed that it's um, it's possible, but it's it should really only be in extremely dire circumstances. Yep, absolutely. Um, yeah. So uh, you have mentioned the Army's rank structure a little bit. Um, I did want to, you know, go into that. There, like you said, are three sort of really separate uh, ways that the, the ranks are separated, if you want to expand on that. Sure. So uh, anyone can go and enlist in, or, or, or try to enlist in the Army. And that's the, that's the, bare, the bare basic soldier. Uh, and depending on how you do on your physical assessments and your uh, and your exams will help uh, determine what type of job you'll get. But um, as long as you basically have a clean record uh, and, and you're capable of serving and you want to serve, you can go and enlist. Uh, if you have no advanced degrees, you'll probably enlist as a, as a private, as an E1. Uh, so you that's on the enlisted side and enlisted sides go from E8 to E9. Um, and, and all the way, and so you go uh, E1 through E5, and those tend to be kind of your, really your worker bees. Um, and uh, and then, then they start going up into a little bit more supervisory and management uh, and advisory roles. Um, and then you have the officer side. Officers have to have at a minimum an undergraduate degree. Uh, however, we do find more often than not, um, after a couple of years, we also have a master's degree or two. Um, so officers will come in as a lieutenant, as a second lieutenant, and they go all the way from 01 to 010, which is actually a four-star general officer. Uh, and, and those tend to uh, like be the joint chiefs of staff, for example, that would be a four-star general officer. Um, and the two will never meet. They, they are partnered at every uh, juncture in the army. So for example, I, as a Lieutenant Colonel uh, and I, I'm the department chair, I have an E8, which is a master sergeant as my enlisted counterpart. And he is my advisor on everything. He is the subject matter expert on regulations and policies and everything else. And he really takes care of the soldiers. So um, I, I like to say it that they have the three Bs, right? The beans, the bullets, and the boots, right? Soldiers wear boots, they gotta eat, and they gotta defend themselves. So that's really the big role of your enlisted soldiers. And then officers, sometimes it gets really boring because I'm constantly doing papers and uh, sending emails and a lot of the administrative stuff. But I really, overall, officers will have that, they have to understand what the situation is that they're going into, and then they'll create this vision of where they wanted to go. Um, and I mean, Prior to, to, to hosting the event, Grace and I were actually talking about our spring field training exercise. And I had this vision that I wanted to take my cadets to their training exercise on a helicopter. And so we are moving mountains, but it looks like it's really gonna happen, right? So I had this vision and then I explained this vision to, to the rest of my staff and, and they really worked to make that happen. And then you also have what are called warrant officers to, to confuse everything even more. Warrant officers, are your specialty. They know one thing and they know it so well, um, it's crazy. So uh, warrant officers can be in almost any branch. Uh, so uh, when I was an air defense artillery officer, I had a maintenance uh, warrant officer and I actually had a tactical warrant officer and they knew the ins and outs of maintaining every vehicle in our fleet. Uh, and then, and they do a lot of the networking. So they're, they are an officer. Um, so they, they have to, they have, uh, they get a little bit of extra pay and, uh, and, and they do get saluted, right? They're not enlisted. They're kind of in between. So they're the subject matter expert. Yeah, I think you made a great point with how enlisted and officers are separate, but that um, they are always paired together to sort of work together. Um, it, it does get kind of uh, sticky for the younger soldiers. So I was 22 when I was a second lieutenant, the, the lowest possible officer rank. 
but I was in charge of people who were much older than me and who had been in the army longer than me and also had the responsibility of making decisions uh, about something I didn't know very much about and they were teaching me about. So there, there is a, a pretty interesting like way that the ranks interact with one another. Um, it really is, so, yeah. So it kind of uh, on the line of, you know, the number of different jobs that people can have. I think um, I, I've always been, you know, my, my own parents have asked me, you know, if I, you know, I'm running with like a rifle in the woods every day when I was in the army. So I feel like there, there is like kind of a misconception of what people do every day in the army. Um, so if you could kind of talk about like what the daily life of a soldier could look like or like the, the wide range of things it, it would look like. Sure. So, um, so the, the job will vary vastly depending on uh, what branch uh, of this, of the, uh, well, what type of job you have um, and what your rank is and even where you're located. So for example, um, if you're infantry, you're gonna train your day is gonna look very different uh, than uh, someone who does logistics. If, you're, if you are um, located uh, supporting an aviation unit in Georgia, it's gonna look significantly different than when you're an air defense artillery officer or in a unit in Germany. And then certainly based upon your rank, right? So um, I have uh, two captains that work with me and I don't expect them to necessarily go out and engage with faculty on, on campus to try and make sure that our operations are running smooth. Um, so, so that'll all look a little bit different, but there are some things that probably look the same for the most part. So uh, when I was a brand new Lieutenant, when I first commissioned uh, PT or physical training, always started at six o'clock in the morning. Uh, typically there's a little bit earlier, they'll do an accountability formation, but six o'clock in the morning is really when our duty day starts and we have PT physical training and that lasts about an hour. And then around seven o'clock, you're released. You can go do your personal hygiene and you can get some breakfast. And then you come back uh, for about a nine o'clock formation, 8.30, nine o'clock formation. And the commander or, the, or the, the senior enlisted leader, they'll get up there and they will give maybe some additional guidance and direction for that day, if, if necessary. Um, on Mondays, it was always maintenance Mondays. Uh, and maintenance Mondays meant that you went and drew, drew your vehicle, your Humvee or your five ton or your deuce and a half, whatever it was. And you went out there with your wrench and your, and your checklist and you made sure everything was running. And by golly, if there was an oil leak, you were going to figure out how to go and get it fixed that day. Um, so, so that would occur and, and you would work on that until done. Uh, and then around noon, you're, you have lunch, right? Uh, the army for the most part kind of plays by big boy rules. So if, if you're not ready to go and eat lunch at noon, you don't go and eat lunch at noon. Um, so, and then when I would come back after lunch, uh, a lot of times I would kind of get stuck doing some of the administrative, uh, the, the administrative details such as operational planning or, or counseling and mentoring meetings, whatever that may be. And then that final formation would be between five and six o'clock in the evening. Uh, and then it'll be any last minute parting notes and then, and then you're gone. Uh, we don't always work on weekends. Uh, it happens, but not always. And then usually once every couple months, uh, we would go out to the field uh, for some training and that would be hmm, seven to 10 days maybe. Uh, and you would sleep and eat and operate everything in the field. You wouldn't go home uh, for about seven to 10 days and that would occur every, every couple of months. Yeah, I think that's uh, a really thorough rendition of what, like, what an average day would look like. I think uh, for a lot of people, they don't realize, you know, most people go home, you know, at, at the end of the day and uh, don't wear their uniform to, you know, bed or to go to the grocery store or whatever. Um, and I, I think like that, again, is like one of those misconceptions, um, you know, question that I have been asked is uh, whether I'm allowed to leave the army base. And the answer is yes, I don't live there. Um, and actually, I, I would say... Um, I'm not sure about a majority, but a lot of people don't live on the base. Um, so if you kind of discuss like who lives in the barracks, like what, what that looks like. So, um, so aside from a few instances, so when you go through initial military training, also known as boot camp, um, or if you're going for uh, on the officer side, you can go to what's called advanced camp and that's about 30 to 35 days. Um, aside from events like that, you typically live uh, in, in a home or apartment, you typically live a normal life. Um, if you are lower enlisted, so E1 through E5 maybe, so the, those really junior ranks, you may, be, um, you may be told you have to live in barracks if you're not married. If you're married, you're not, you're not in barracks. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you have kids and you're, you don't, if you're single and you have children as well. 
Yep, absolutely. Um, but if you're you know, E1 to E5, you're probably going to live in the barracks. Um, and then, but for the most part, uh, you don't you don't have to live on base. A lot of people do prefer to live on base. And uh, so bases, think of them as like little mini cities, self-contained cities. So we have housing, we have, uh, we have food, <laughs> lots of food, anything from fast food joints, typically like Subway, Burger King. Uh, we have food courts. Uh, some places have actual restaurants. Uh, we have a grocery store. We have a retail store. Um, so it's really a very self-contained little city. Um, and so, and there is housing and there's beautiful housing, to be honest. Uh, so some people really do want to live on base, but oftentimes there's a, there's like a, there's a waiting list to get on there. Um, and they do try to service, uh, lower enlisted and lower grade officers first, just because their housing allowance is in not always commensurate with where they're living. Um, so for example, in this area, the DC cost of living is exceptionally high and they, we don't get compensated financially to really live in, um, have a good quality of life um, in, in our areas based off of the lower pay grades. So, um, so otherwise you, you know, if you're in a transient mode, you're typically in a hotel or you're in uh, some kind of a, a, a part, partly private uh, quarters, you may have a roommate depending on what, it, what the training is. Um, but yeah, in over 24 years of service, I've only ever lived in open bay uh, barracks twice. And then I had a roommate once. Uh, and then other than that, I've always been able to live where I wanted and, and how I wanted. Yeah, I would say that there is a pretty stark difference between like the living conditions for enlisted soldiers versus um, the officers. So I mean, I also, uh, other than during training, I've been pretty lucky in my like conditions. Um, but there are certainly a lot of uh, more bay type and by bay, we mean like, eight beds to this, like a sort of a giant room and that's like, and you have like a locker where you put your things. Um, so, but that, I would say that that is more of like a, a, a situation in a, a training camp uh, type of situation. Um, Man, would you, would you discuss like boot camp and what like basic training looks like? Yeah, so um, gosh, it was, <laughs> I went to boot camp in 1997. So things may have changed, um, but for the most part, they have what's called reception, uh, and that can last anywhere from two to seven days, depending on when your class actually starts. Uh, and that allows you to get your a photo taken, get all your uniforms, um, you know, kind of start the military process, but in, um, in a softer way, learning simple commands, learning basic rank structures, and then you go to your, to your platoon. Um, and I went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, uh, which is a which was a um, an integrated uh, basic boot camp. So I had males and females. Some of them were only males at the time, and um, and there was not unlike what we always see in movies where the drill sergeants in your face and yelling at you. We didn't really have a whole lot of that. Were they yelling? Yes. Why? Probably because there was about eighty of us, and the, it was like herding cats, right? So they had to be loud to, to get our attention and get us moving in the right direction, and. It was 11 o'clock at night, right? We're all tired and we got to get moving, right? We have a lot to do that night. Um, do they get frustrated? Yes. Why? Because for the love of Christmas, some people cannot figure out their left from their right. It doesn't matter if you're in week one or week seven. Come on, people, left and right, right? So they get frustrated just like all, the rest of us. But, um, but you know what? They're humans. And uh, in the end, they, they treated us with as much dignity and respect as they would their peers, but understanding that we were also trainees. Um, so we would do everything from learning and it starts off basic, right? You've got to break down a little bit of the individual to make sure that we can all operate as a team. Um, so um, it was everything from learning how to walk in formation, uh, how, to, how to dress appropriately, how to make our beds, right? Uniformity. Um, of, of all that stuff, learning how to eat faster, really fast, um, and, and all those sorts of things. And then, then it's, it, it'll slowly build. It was learning land navigation. It was learning how to fire my individual weapon. Um, it, was, it was learning all kinds of different aspects um, of training, how to, how to dig a foxhole. I would go through, um, it's called the gas chamber. It's really just it's like riot gas uh, and you, you know, it's trusting your gear, learning to trust your gear. That's a big one, right? So they, you put your, your gas mask on, you walk in the building where there's all this riot gas essentially. And you're like, oh, I can breathe. 
and then they tell you to break your seal and oh uh, then it gets ugly it's not dripping everywhere yeah. your eyes are tearing yeah. i wipe my face and my whole like <laughs> mouth is burning it was a terrible, terrible yes you know but it's teaching you hey the army has great gear and it will protect you and you have to trust it um so so that's kind of a, a little bit of of basic training in a nut roll um, I, so thank you for your answer. I think um, you were mentioning that you had to go to Fort Jackson because that was the integrated like uh, male and female um, training area. I, I think like some people might not be familiar that there was a, a ban on women in, serving in combat roles um, as as recently as 2015. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Secretary Ash Carter was actually the one who lifted that. Um, so that actually, so that I could be in, in an infantry battalion where I didn't even actually serve as an infantry officer. And then also again, infantry is like, like saving private Ryan, like the soldiers that you see on like the beach shooting, you know, getting shot at and stuff. Those, those types of roles were technically close to women, um, until 2015, although women did serve in, in like those types of roles prior to that without the proper recognition as like military police officers. Um, or, um, or as something called cultural support teams. Um, so yeah, I, I did want to sort of bring, bring that up about like the integration that it was still happening when I was in and they had just started integrating um, the whole force when you had just started your career in, in 97. So um, females were, um, so when I, when I commissioned, air defense artillery was actually considered a combat arms um, and females were allowed to go into the, into the Patriot weapon system because it was so far in the rear. Uh, we, we protect everything forward. So we weren't typically not engaged in um, like a tactical ground fight. And females could um, be in combat arms units, but we were always in a supporting role. Um, so you, we could actually have females in field artillery, for example, but they were in your headquarters. Uh, mm -hmm. so, it, so females could support, but up until most, you know, 2015, like Grace said, we could not be an active uh, participant. We couldn't hold that branch or that MOS, that military occupational specialty that was associated with uh, tactical ground operations. Yeah, so um, we're coming up on the 30 minute mark. Um, so I did wanna head into some of the audience questions. Uh, so thank you, Colonel Pfeiffer, for you know walking us through a lot of pretty difficult concepts um, for the first half. Um, so uh, we did, we received two questions um, through the website. So I'll, I'll ask those first. Um, and then afterwards we'll, we'll ask individual people to turn on their mics and um, ask those questions. So the first one we received was um, how is research completed by civilians, professors, for example, uh, how is it used by the military? Uh, what are some examples of research projects that are not what we would typically, typically consider as military functions, such as developing weapons? Um, so when I first read this question, the first thing that came to mind uh, was GPS, which came about, and which is something that you know we used to use a lot, probably less so now, um, but that was a, a sort of a function of a military advancement. Um, other things that come to mind are like um, EpiPens um, or freeze-dried food. Um, or probably infamously cargo pants were, uh, those, those were came from the military too. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you had anything to add on, on that, uh, Colonel Pfeiffer. So uh, the military as a whole really is a huge proponent. Like we really spearhead a lot of advanced technology, um, but it does go the other way around. We do look at a lot of academic research um, because we realize we cannot do it all ourselves. Um, so even, you know, uh, when like COVID, for example, you know, there was probably, we are learning a whole lot about uh, how, how internally we can slow the spread, um, how, what the virus looks like so that we can better, um, better prepare our own units. Um, but, you know, th there is a lot of technology that, um, that the military offers to to the civilian side, and and it's and it's reciprocated uh, coming back from the institutional, or the academic, um, or the business model. We take a whole lot of uh, research and understanding from them, also because you know we are a very large government organization, and so for us to really shift and change, it takes a lot of time. And sometimes the the civilian side can operate a lot faster than we can. And they have various levels of funding that are not uh, not easily accessible to the United States military. Yeah, I was a, a communications officer, so there was definitely a lag in the technology. Like we were still using radios from like Vietnam era, 
I won't get into it. It's, uh, <laughs> um, but but you're right, and especially that the technology on the civilian side is sometimes a lot more advanced. Um, but I think also to answer the question of how civilian research could influence the military, um, also research on leadership and how teams work together. I think those are those are also um, uh, pieces of research that the military uses, or um, a lot of psych research on like PTSD um, and how to. Um, I mean, how to integrate people together. That's all examples of um, of research that the, the military has used from the civilian side. Yeah, um, those are great examples, absolutely. Yeah, yeah we do something called um, uh, MRT. Mm, I'm blanking on what it means, something readiness training. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna say mental readiness training. Um, but yeah, those are, um, those are uh, it's another program for the army to sort of uh, instill uh, resilience within within soldiers um, and like teach like coping mechanisms because it can be a really stressful job. And again, those are those are uh, civilian programs that the military has adopted. Yeah. Um, so the military does look, especially when you're looking at those sorts of things. We tend to have a, a little bit more myopic approach mm -hmm. um, to looking at things. So when we incorporate academic research, um, I think it really broadens the our perspective on how. Um, life can influence a service member or, you know, how it can um, change and how we can adapt and change to um, situations. Um, okay. And then, so uh, the other question that we received um, was concerning climate change. It's a really thoughtful question. Um, so uh, do we think that the military will play a role in the fight against climate change? And if so, what might that role look like? Okay. Uh, so, so I, don't believe the art or the military would be um, would actively fight that. Um, I mean, it's it's um, something that we I don't think we could actively fight. It's not a, it's a, not a, a something that we can visibly see. Um, but we would do so, I think, in a more uh, a little bit more passive way. In that we're trying to reduce maybe our carbon footprint. So when I was stationed at the Defense Language Institute, I know there was a major push by uh, it was like a five or ten year plan to reduce the carbon footprint of the of that that base in Monterey um, exponentially, and that included everything from putting in when they were building new buildings, they had to be considered green buildings. It was putting in solar panels on top of the fitness systems on fit, on top of the fitness uh, facility. Um, replacing windows, um, figuring out better better ways of heating and cooling uh, what we do. Um, so I think that's how, I think that's one way that we would try to um, affect or influence um, climate change for the better. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. There have been a lot of sort of scathing reports that have come out, especially since about 2015, 2017. Um, about how large the military, the, especially the United States military's carbon footprint is mm -hmm. all over the world. Um, so I think there have been, uh, there has been movement um, to curb the effects that the military has had on worsening climate change. Um, but I, I also don't foresee the military taking an active role in um, fighting climate change. I think right now we're trying to do like less damage than what's being done right now. Right. Um, so I but, think, you know, going back to your, your prior question, <clears throat> you know, where we would learn from academic research, I think that's a great one right there is understanding, you know, environmental research and then figuring out how we could possibly apply that into our own operations and capabilities. Right. Um, and when we were previously discussing this, um, the climate change has come up as, you know, a security threat um, to the United States and, you know, to our military. Um, if you could sort of speak to how you think the military might be uh, reacting to climate change as a security threat. Um, so, I, so, I mean, the, I think the best example that would come to mind would be like the Arctic, um, you know, Russia, for example, has a very large um, littoral region that borders up with the Arctic uh, and, you know, they are, pursuing avenues through the Arctic as maybe some of those, uh, the ice melts and they can, you know, eventually get a, a through a passage um, over the Northern hemisphere um, so that they can, you know, access the rest of the Atlantic maybe. Yeah, I, I can definitely foresee that being more of an issue as our, you know, as the world that we understand it comes to change. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, starting, starting now, we're actually going to switch over to having the audience turn on the cameras and or 